Hello everybody, it is Dr. Z. Here we are in chapter 27. This is going to be a multi-part chapter when we talk about communism in the Soviet Union and then fascism in Italy and in Nazi Germany. So this is part one, um, the beginning of Soviet communism. Um, there'll probably be about two videos on Soviet communism. When we think about these ideologies together, communism and fascism, they both fall under the umbrella of totalitarianism. I like to think of them, even though they are on opposite ends of the political spectrum, left and right, um, I like to think of them, though, however, as close cousins because they both are totalitarian. The experience of life under both of these regimes um, brought hardship to the people for myriad reasons um, in the countries that had this style of government. Um, so as we go through, you probably want to make a list in your notebooks about similarities and differences. A big difference, of course, between the two is economics. Fascist um, policies are capitalist, um, yet they are also socialist. There's a lot of socialist social safety nets that happen under fascism. Communism, of course, economically is communist, yet also lots of social safety nets and uh, comes out of socialism itself. So. The other thing to think about in the sense of totalitarianism, though, is the full control, right? And so wrapping our heads around what it means um, to be in a totalitarian state um, will be part of what we are trying to get at in this unit. As I said, though, we're going to start with communism. Con the Khan Academy gives us some really nice context here. They write, the Soviet Union was born during a period of deep crisis. Lenin, the Bolshevik leadership, um, had to guide Russia out of World War I, deal with the famine in the early 20s, nationalize an economy that lagged behind Western rivals, and to get out of the war, which was their number one goal, right, they had adopted hardline communism. And this imposed state control directly over the economy. These strict measures went over pretty badly with peasants and many others. So when Lenin got to his other goals, he was forced to reconsider his response to the famine and the issue of nationalization. So he brings in what is called the new economic policy, and this is probably the largest economic um, thing that Lenin is known for. Um, he decides to bring back some capitalism into some sectors of the economy. Peasants were allowed to sell any surplus grain for a profit, um, and of course, paying a tax on what they produced. And small factories were handed back into private ownership. And the most important industries were still controlled by the state, though. Um, and production increased. So this is an economic policy under a communist regime that has some capitalist aspects to it. So some ways to think about this, right, is that if you have war communism, right, somebody grows 10 tons of grain, the government takes the surplus, all of the surplus, right? You're left with a ton for subsistence farming, right? Under the NEP, you grow 10 tons of grain. The government takes about half of that. Then you sell four of it, right? And you're left with one ton plus the proceeds from selling the four. So, you know, in general, slightly better, at least for the farmers. Um, some results then were that private business and agriculture helped the economy be more profitable. We had less governmental intervention in business, um, and this made the Bolsheviks seem flexible and pragmatic, yet experimental. And then after Lenin passes away and Stalin comes in, um, we will be talking about his economic policies as well, which are quite different. Stalin's are called the five-year plans, which is a very totalitarian style of economics, right? Whereas Lenin's NEP was government control mixed with free enterprise and private ownership, communism mixed with capitalism. When Lenin passed away, Stalin took a very authoritarian stance. Um, an example is that his, his reaction to food production crisis in the late 20s, he argued that grain was a vital national resource and he used state power to forcibly confiscate it, uh, confiscate it from individual farmers. And he waged a class warfare against the wealthy peasants who were known as the Kulaks, and many of them were killed. 
He also forcibly collectivized um, workers um, and farmers in the Ukraine, which resulted in the death of around 4 million Ukrainians. This famine was called Holodomor um, and is something that holds a lot of animosity um, even today um, when the Ukrainians think about the Soviet era. Stalin also pursued what was called a command economy. He wanted a, quote, revolution from above in which power emanated throughout society from a centralized state. And that state was to be administered by the Communist Party and his leader. One of the things that Stalin is known for are his purges. Um, this is really a terrible um, legacy of his rule. Agriculture and industry, of course, are organized through the five-year plans. And as the 30s wore on, Soviet leadership pushed for more extreme forms of centralization, right, in this command economy. Um, and he tried to ensure people's loyalty by purging or eliminating those who were unloyal to the party or himself. And he used fear, terror, and suppression as tactics for this. The Great Purges were during the two-year period in the late 30s, um, and this was a campaign of political repression. It's called the Great Purge or the Great Terror. Um, it also tends to be, as you can imagine from the title there, compared to the terror in the French Revolution as well. So the victims, of course, were Communist Party and government officials who were deemed not loyal to Stalin and Stalinism. Also peasants, particularly the Kulaks. Um, and Red Army leadership, right, who was not seen as loyal to um, the new government. He used tactics of police surveillance, neighbors being suspicious and denouncing other neighbors. There were arbitrary executions, um, show trials and imprisonment. Um, and from 30 to 38, Okay, um, there were probably anywhere between 600,000 to 1.2 million people murdered in the Soviet Union. So when we look at these numbers, right, we have 777,000 judicial executions, right? Um, and this is considered the Great Purge. And of course, the numbers are a little bit shaky um, because of record keeping. So, you know, but somewhere between 600 to 1.2 million is, is the number that um, historians generally land on. Um, also, there was massive ethnic cleansing against various minorities that were living in the USSR. And these operations um, of the NKVD, which is uh, with the largest one being the Polish operation in the N of the NKVD, and there were over 100,000 Polish communists and other Poles who were exterminated as well, right? So this is the People's Commissariat for Internet, Internal Affairs, okay? This is the organization within Stalinism that polices, um, it runs the prisons, and also the labor camps. All right, we are going to pause here, and I will see you in the second half.